Yo. Your grace, high bishops, give up uh, Charles Palmabocco, Matthias and Katia, all of you, Reverend Sisters and Reverend Fathers, and uh, members of the parish communities, representatives of the different parish organizations, and all of you invited here and our distinguished scholarly team that is always uh, helped develop the programs of uh, CAPDEL. You've been greeted already, but otherwise would have been to bid all of you a very good morning still. And uh, you, 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 you heard so much about, about, about this project, about its beginning and all. Temptation for me is if I went down the same lane, would be the temptation would be to keep you here till mid mid uh, midday or beyond that. So, what is it? The motivation you've listened to, the details of what the capital now seeks to do you've listened to. And a little bit of the history is also being shared with you. So what is left? What is left is simply to affirm that the original motivation for this program was way before the election of the present pope. But the challenges which inspired their thought about this program have become more manifest these days in the teaching and the leadership of Pope Francis. The one thing that the present Pope is made come very much alive is that thing about inequalities. And in a lot of his writings, the crucial thing that he always addresses is inequality. And what He's used to saying these days, in the wake of the COVID pandemic, is that a healthcare pandemic has revealed a lot of other pandemics in society. The pandemic of poor access to healthcare, the pandemic of fragile job structures, the pandemic of economies which are fragile based, the greatest pandemic of inequality in access to anything that contributes to the dignity of people, and the pandemic of a whole lot of social housing insecurities and all. So this is what the Pope is now talking about. And as I say, the Pope was elected in 2013, so certainly these were not thoughts and ideas that inspired the creation of capital, but they simply serve now to manifest the basic concern, and that was the basic concern of inequality. You cannot have a nation which has a common destiny and a common goal, but have an inequal pathways towards the realization of that goal. It's an impossibility. We cannot all recite the same pledge and list the very many virtues and ideals that we desire for this country and have very many desperate and unequal ways of attaining those same ideals and those same goals. So if there's any one single reason that you want to take away from here about this initiative, Capdel, it is inequality. It was inequality then, it is inequality now, and inequality that is likely to accompany us way into the future. There's inequality in jobs, there's inequality in financial gain. There's inequality in access to decent health care. There's inequality now in education. Although education is always presented by the former Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, 
as the key to the narrative, the human dignity narrative which the SDGs stood for. And then the Korean leader, president of the Bank of, Ga uh, Bank of uh, the World Bank, also presented the impossibility of envisioning any culture developed without a decent educational system. So everybody readily talks about education as a key to a lot of growth and a lot of development and ultimately the realization of people's dignities. But a pathway to it is fraught with unequal structures, unequal systems and all. We live here in Ghana. Way before the politicians started introducing free SS and free all of that, you know that in some basic schools, parents pay more to get their children into special private schools than they did pay to get their children into universities. And yet, the students of those basic schools would have to compete in the same BCE exams with those from the villages, and then compete with the same for entrance and admission to the SSS, and ultimately also to the universities. So how can you feed children with cassava and others with rice and help them and expect that they would all be healthy when the time comes for you to check their health conditions? And so how can you feed somebody with a classroom where one teacher handles six classes and a classroom with surplus of teachers for different subject matters and expect that when the BC time comes, they would all take the same exam and expect that they would all succeed. And so year in and year out, you've always listened and read about how percentage of passes and percentage of failures in all of these exams. So those were some of, the, some of the thoughts that led into this. And the key word is inequality. And can inequality be dealt with or solved? We thought that it was possible at least to try to initiate something that can help deal with inequalities in our midst. Incidentally, right now, it's become the crucial office and the crucial task of our dicastery in the Vatican. But at that time, we were thinking about it for the development of Ghanaians and possibly even for other English-speaking countries in West Africa who might need some educational material which was thought like this. So the biggest challenge is how you deal with inequalities especially in the area of education, especially in the development of talents, and especially in the pursuit and the development of people's dignities. All of us believe readily in the church that God created man in his image and likeness, and that is a source of dignity. God created a human person in his image and likeness, and then entrusts that into the hands of all of us to ensure that these are equally developed so that the personhood or the person that God created us all to be would, be all, would all merit equally the dignities that we have. So that was what it was. At that time, we were the archbishops. And so the decision about doing this was handled with the administrative structures that we had in those days. So between the courier and the secretariat, and the administrative board, the idea about starting an initiative like this happened. And the question was, where was the finance going to come from? We never thought and never ever, never crossed the mind of any of us that the diocese was going to be saddled with such a huge expenditure. So the first request went to the Italian Bishops' Conference, whereby Divine Providence, one Giovanni, what is his name again, Giovanni Battista Colombo. Colombo was then the consultant of the Italian Bishops' Conference for projects outside. 
And when he saw the project about education that was meant to deal with inequalities, he grabbed that and managed to convince the other members of the approving committee. And so they approved this to the tune of about 900,000 euros. When that approval came, the Franciscans had decided to move from here to Solpon. And we we're hoping that they were going to give us this property free so we wouldn't have to build a studio. That expectation delayed very much in its being realized. So ultimately, the need to develop a structure from the scratch began, and that was this building being brought up. Almost at that time, one other Catholic friend who used to run a phantom from television in Kumasi also was beginning to fold up. And he offered on sale the antenna that he used, and we negotiated to buy that antenna. That's what you see there. All of that was dismembered and brought from Kumasi and mounted over here to serve as the antenna for the project. The details of the realization of the project change with time. Change with time means it changed with how we thought we could easily realize this vision. And so at one point, when this antenna was structured up, at that time the government of Ghana allowed the use of transmitters which were called the MMDS. That allowed you from a single transmitter point to send a lot of multiple signals. So we thought that from a single transmission point, we could communicate with several classes in several areas at the same time. Then government changed. And when the government changed, a new policy came that reserved MMDS transmission for commercial mobile phone industry. So with that change, we also had to migrate from a vision about using MMDS transmitters to discovering other means of carrying and sending our signals. And so that became the simple application for a, a, a license to enable us to transmit differently. Then, by that time moved into Rome, I met the leader of the National Geographic magazine, Jean Chase, who came and discussing this with her, suggested that, but in Kenya, there is a group that does uh, such transmissions, basic transmission for basic schools. And uh, the group is called BRIC, B-R-C-K. And so we decided to contact the BRIC group in Nairobi with view to realizing this. What the BRIC group did was that he has a suitcase with 40 laptops. And the lessons were loaded onto those laptops. So our vision then was if we had a couple of these suitcases with laptops, the lessons for each class would be loaded onto the laptop and would be one laptop or one suitcase for a class. And so the children from the class would just come pull up the laptops and with the lessons already loaded onto it, education can be done. The advantage we were interested in, in handling at that time was introduce students not only to learning and studying, but also making them ICT, sensitive to ICT or digital you know, uh, study method. So when we went to the break, whatever, to, to negotiate for a purchase of that, then they came up with, you know, if, if we're going to do this for you, then you have to assure us that you need how many? How many thousands of uh, copies? Huh? So, so they gave us such a, we knew you need to give us a guarantee that you need over, over 10,000 of these. We were just initiating a project. And to have, to have committed to buying 10,000 didn't make sense. So we said, leave it for now. And so the alternative for transmitting the education continued. And at one point, the thing was, you use a, an LCD screen into a school, 
and go with the lessons on a pen drive. You hook it into the LCD and you can do lessons with the facilitator in the classroom who would have been invited over here to be introduced to the material. And so we tried that. And then the problem also came with security. Would you leave the LCD screens in the classroom overnight? Or would you have to take them and then lock them up in some office, headmaster's office, and later on during the day go take them and display them again? So that was another challenge. And the second challenge was, it was source of power and energy. So we knew we, at one point we had generators that we took around to develop the power to run some of those programs. But that ultimately also wasn't the best solution to be adopted, and so we kept the search. And finally, we came to this thing about getting on the national television platform uh, to send the lessons and everything out while we figure out a way of making the special access to designated schools and designated points. So in this, we still, deep down behind our minds, consider this to be probably a, a very good solution to the problem about, about education, about access to good teachers, about quality education, and making them targeted to the places that we want and want to designate them. So that's a little bit of the, of the journey that this project is made. So we were inspired by a few things about the past of this diocese, the past of our church. Anybody who knows about the history of the Catholic Church here in this diocese knows that the SMA fathers, when they came, and started missionary work, also did two things at the same time. They developed schools and they developed dispensaries. And their records suggest that, or record says that, at one point, when they were left with only 2.5 shillings and had to decide what to do, either keep themselves alive or finance the project that they had, the decision was to use the 2.5 shillings to buy exercise books and pencils for the students, and they themselves depend on charity from the rich people who were working in the castles. This was in Elmina. So at one point in the history of this church, the missionaries decided to expand, if you want, give their lives to educating people, and they themselves risk the challenge of going hungry. But that was what happened. So when, through the kind generosity of the Italian Bishops Conference, we had this project approved, and we could put up this and put up this antenna, and uh, you know the different vehicles and whatever type of thing, and and begin starting that thing. A big thing was that recognizing again, because we're the Archbishop, knowing how fragile our own financial thing was. We didn't want to bring any extra financial burden on the diocese. And as it turned out to be, in fact, it was the diocese that benefited from the sum of this project. Because at that time, the thing that was happening was also the purchase of land. We had to pay for land at Kasua. And the big senior Amwenu was negotiating for a land just outside Kasua too. And at that time, we were looking at Mimpia, some land, and then some other land near Abrobiano. And the huge cost of that at one point, how to rely on some of this grant that we received from this, which we freely thought we could support because this thing was built on Archdiocesan land. So there, it, was, it should be a way of also reciprocating or giving support also to the Archdiocese. So that's what it was and that's what has happened. And to run this, we created a board. We had to register the foundation or the project or initiative and a board was created. A board was created with several members, some of whom are here, some of whom on account of the COVID were reluctant to travel and decided to watch this on television or you know, later on get a, uh, the recorded message uh, to look at. But the one thing that I also want to say is that 
why am I still related with this project? It is not because I want to possess any project. Knowing where I stand now and knowing the lessons of every cardinal, there have been days that cardinals have left their countries to go to Rome to a conclave and never get a chance to see even their bedroom again. So it is very absurd to approach any of this with a sense of possessiveness. But there was also the equally the guarantee, the, the need to guarantee the, uh, and to ensure and to safeguard the continuity and the success of the project. So if I have remained attached to this project, it's simply to do that, is to ensure that the project succeeds. Of course, I know that when an archbishop goes out, a new archbishop comes. But a new archbishop comes, and the new archbishop wasn't part of the decision. And we, don't want, we didn't want this to be a burden on any pastor of the archdiocese who would come in the future. So we try to safeguard access to the financial means to keep this running, while on the board, the sitting archbishop is always the number two of the board. And so we try to create this symbiosis or this work together, recognizing that this project needs to serve the diocese, needs to serve all of this country, and needs to serve the educational needs, which have always been a crucial part of the ministry of the church. But conceiving all of that, we always wanted to ensure the success of the project and that when ensuring the success, do not also prescribe it as an imposition that any coming archbishop would have to necessarily bear. In other words, for me, I reckon with the possibility that we can have a pastor in the future of the archdiocese who can say that this is not a top priority or whatever type of thing. And when that should happen, this should not be a burden. And so over and above this, apart from the board that we've established, we try to create another board, not members of the same board in Accra, start a small foundation there about, about, about the same thing to raise funds also from there. And the same initiative is taken to parts of the United States to also stick to raise funds to support and to maintain the project. And of course, in the Vatican itself, we try to present this as a project whenever it is possible, always to enable the wherewithal that the project needs for its success and for its gain. So I'm glad, therefore, that all of you from seeing some uh, value in, in this and have graciously accepted to be here for its inauguration. And this time we're particularly grateful for the archdiocese for having maintained one priest here, Father David, although knowing that, you know, normally you don't keep a priest in a, in a parish for a hand, over him. How many years? <laughs> so, so, you know, I think, I think they've been, they've been, the diocese, the diocese has been very gracious in allowing David, you know, to continue here so that, you know, he, you know, he helps with the, with the, with the growth and development of this. It's, it's, it's a very deep sense of gratitude that we always bear. That also means that it's up to the board to consider the possibility in the future of engaging probably a lay director or whatever director of the, of the, of the, of the project. So there is still, a lot has been done, but there's still a lot to do. And we're glad that there's something already going. And so thanking the archdiocese for allowing Father David to do all this, we also like to thank the necessary partners of this project. And the necessary partners came from the University of Cape Coast. So the phone of the leader of that is just rang to remind me that I should not forget he's behind me. So, so uh, 
the issue of uh, Pro, uh, Mr. Kumsin, who at that time used to run the, uh, the, the distance education. Yeah, distance. Yeah? Yeah, distance education of the UCC, so who had a lot of ideas and experience to share. And from UCC, you could also identify the type of teachers and the type of uh, course writers and develop that were looking for and needed. And so put together some of teams, some of whom are, are out there in the corner right by the drama people. So we want to thank all of you today for everything that you've done. We want to thank the com in, uh, com uh, uh, communications authority in Accra and uh, Mr. The communication that is a popular interview TV figure. Kweku yeah, Sechado, for, for, for his kindness in wanting to negotiate a special deal for our access to the TV type of thing. Because as you know, the government have sublet this whole TV transmit to a private company, which is doing that as a business. And therefore, our getting online it implies that we need to pay a huge sum. But Sechado led us in negotiation with a, with a team to kind of give us a huge discount that enables us to do this. Because doing education is not for any personal gain. Our income level is almost nil. Everything a lot is based on donations and grants. And so that's how, that's how far we've come. And uh, where we plan to go in the future I would imagine that at a, certain point, at a certain point, the board will probably have to make or probably sit down to discuss how all of this, because that's where it is, how all of this can serve the pastoral priorities also of the diocese. And ultimately, when things really get developed, take the pastoral priorities of the Ghana Bishops Conference all on board to make this serve the national needs that, that uh, you know, we aspire after and we hope to achieve. So thank you, and uh, I hope I've not bored you enough, but it's to let you know where we've come from, and as for where we're going, we put our hands in the hands of the risen Lord, that he may lead us and guide our path. And so when you look at the, the logo of the capital and you look at the center, what do you see? A footprint, Mubwa. When you look at the logo and you look at the center, what do you see? You've noticed it? Yeah. yeah. So, you do an answer. You can 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 do an answer.